Okay, welcome everyone. I think we're going to get started here. Um, and we would like to begin with the land acknowledgement. I want to begin by acknowledging that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The school also recognizes the work of the Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationships that, lead to the, that led to the creation of this acknowledgement. Um, so welcome again. Uh, I'm Dan Dioka. I'm an associate professor in practice here in the Urban Planning and Design Department. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so before we get to today's event, a quick reminder that we have live captioning available. Uh, for our virtual audience. Um, so to enable captions, click, click the closed ca captioning button at the bottom of the live stream window. Um, also want to uh, invite everyone to join us for an upcoming GSD public program this Friday, April 1st at 12.30 p.m. Join us for a lecture by the Peruvian architects Sandra Barkley and Jean-Pierre Cruz. They'll be discussing their practice, which combines a resolutely contemporary design sensibility with a careful and open-minded search for meaningful local conditions. All lectures are live streamed. Harvard ID holders are also welcome to attend uh, programs in person. More information is available on the GSD website. Uh, so now for tonight's event, which is supported by uh, the Rachel uh, Dorothy Tanner Memorial Lecture Fund. This fund was established in 2006, funded by alumnus Reuben Mark. It was named for Tanner, who was an urban planner and a lawyer who cared deeply about people, their lives, and their living conditions. So our lecture tonight, as you all know, um, is by Sam Obexen. It's really an honor to introduce Sam. Actually, it's, a, it's a, even more than that. It's an honor to finally meet Sam in person until today. We've actually only met uh, by, by a Zoom. Uh, I, I Zoom met Sam in 2020 when I was preparing to teach a studio called This Land is Your Land, which invited students here at the GSD. Uh, to work with a nonprofit in Minneapolis called the Native American Community Development Institute, which Sam is president of the board of. Um, and uh, th that, that's an organization that was working and still is working in what is one of the few Native American urban neighborhoods in the country. Um, without, without exception, everybody I, uh, I talked to about the neighborhood said, oh, you should, you should really talk to Sam Bexon. Uh, and in fact, to this day, anytime I use any combination of the words urban design, Native American, or Minneapolis, I get asked if I know Sam Olbexen. Happy to say now that yes, I do know Sam. Um, yes, uh, I do, and, and he's been uh, really instrument. He was really instrumental to the studio that 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 I taught. He helped he helped me frame it. Um, was really a generous critic. Came to all of our reviews, and uh, really helped. I think all of us better understand what we should be thinking about and how we might make recommendations for this neighborhood. Uh, that would resonate with the Native American residents who called it home. Uh, so for this, I'm hugely grateful. Um, so actually, Sam actually made it into the studio syllabus. As I was reading up on him back in 2020, I came across a statement of solidarity he made with Black Lives Matter that I thought, I thought our students should see. Quote, are we asking the difficult questions and challenging our own biases? Are we tackling the core social issues as a profession to initiate true structural change? Or will we essentially just rehash the same old design thinking of a broken system? Um, I thought that was really well put, and I put it right in the syllabus. Um, so you have a bio of Sam, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but some highlights. Sam is uh, an indigenous architect with over 25 years of, uh, of design, comprehensive planning, and cultural visioning experience. He's an, uh, an alum of this very institution, a Master of Urban Design class of 2005. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, he's committed to helping advance cultural pre the, the cultural preservation, economic growth, health, and well-being of native, native communities through sound planning and practical design strategies that are beautiful, innovative, sustainable, functional, and culturally specific. He's published nationally and I would also say regularly as a thought leader in contemporary Native American design theory. Uh, he's known as a pro progressive and skilled design thinker on culturally significant projects. He produces unique and in inventive design solutions that respond to cultural tradition in innovative and contemporary ways without relying on stereotypical imagery. He's passionate about serving his community. He holds leadership uh, positions with a number of American Indian organizations, including NACTI. 
and has received numerous awards and recognitions for his design and community service. So with that, please join me in welcoming Sam Bexson. All right, well, th thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's, it's all true, I know. Um, uh, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, again, uh, I'm a graduate of the Master's of Architecture and Urban Design program here uh, in 2005. And so I've only been back here once, so it's nice to see uh, a review happening when I come in and see the nice the exhibits and, and have everyone here. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is that it's, it's kind of not an indigenous thing for someone to be standing up at a podium uh, talking to a group of people there. So. Um, I like dialogues and I like conversations, so feel free to just interrupt, raise your hands, and, and make this a dialogue through the presentation, uh, because that's how communication happens. That's how, um, and you'll see some of the community, community engagement that I do, um, that's how you really get some authentic listening that's happened. But um, let's see, I have, so um, this is me, I won't bore you with, with all the details, but I, um, um, I'm a, citizen of the White Earth Nation in Minnesota. It's an Anishinaabe tribe. I'm also a graduate of Harvard University at this program. Uh, and I founded Full Circle Indigenous Planning and Design. On, and as you'll see in a minute, part of that is out of a class that I took here at Harvard. Um, you can see, what was it? Uh, GSD 7216 Establishing Practice. Do they still teach this class here? Uh, Sort of, okay. Well, my final project here was creating a culturally focused design practice. And so my talk is, is, is a little bit about my work. Uh, it's more about the work of the communities that I work with because it's really their projects. Um, but just the, the types of things I did after I graduated. So maybe uh, some, of, some of you will have similar paths in your own communities. Um, but the, the key question that we asked in this, in this class for me was, you know, what is important? Uh, and why is it important? Why am I even coming to graduate school? And part of the reason I chose a Master of Urban Design here um, was I already had a, a BARC uh, from my undergraduate, and I always wanted to go to grad school. It was just kind of this arbitrary goal of mine. Um, but as I really thought about it, um, my interest lied more than just individual buildings, that it's the relationships of buildings, it's how communities build themselves, it's, it's about tribal planning, and, um, and, and so the, the urban design program was great because it helped me um, just be, be exposed to so many different uh, aspects of uh, how you get something done in the built environment, because there are all the political things, there are um, everything from landscape issues to city issues to uh, rural to uh, reservation. There's a whole lot of things that have to do with uh, just simply government that actually get in the way or hinder or can help uh, design happen. Um, so after I graduated, uh, I worked here in Boston at, at a firm called Elkus Manfredi. It's a great firm. Worked at MSNR in Minneapolis when I came back. Uh, and then just five years later, go backwards, I founded Full Circle in Planning uh, at the time. Um, and my first project um, was an ask by a community organization to do a pro bono project. It was a nonprofit. Um, and so that essentially launched my um, practice. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, but since then, um, I've been an independent consultant. I've had a joint ownership with Cunningham Group. Um, and now I am a single owner LLC. So I've gone through some different changes in how I've been um, operating as a practice. But it's all been um, based on that same fundamental question is why am I even doing any of this and what makes me um, get up in the morning? Um, I wanted to focus a practice that, that focused on community, culture, the environment, and seven generational thinking. Um, and uh, you know how to, how to really make, uh, be par part of projects that have true impact to indigenous communities. When I was in, in undergraduate school, um, an elder heard that I was uh, studying architecture, and he, he literally says, get in my pickup truck. And he, he told me to get in his truck, and we, he zoomed off, and we were on the reservation, and he drove me up to the public housing. And it was, you know, uh, poverty, there was you know, cars out front, it was just not a great environment for anyone to live in, let alone the next generation of people. And he says, you have to come back and do something about this. So that was a commitment of mine to, to come back uh, to my community and to all tribal communities and, and uh, um, help. 
So um, a vision, a thriving, so my, my vision for communities are thriving, healthy, indigenous communities connected to culture, nature, and beauty. Uh, my mission to reconnect people to culture and nature through innovative, impactful, and beautiful design. Uh, to build a design practice focused on social equity, environmental justice, and community building. So that was the basis of my classwork here, and it still is my vision, mission, and goals for what I do. The types of things that you can do as uh, an architect, as a landscape architect, as a planner, as an urban designer, um, uh, or all these, we don't have to read them all, but, um, but they're all about how do you build community. I come from a community that is really teeter, but was teetering on the edge of like extinction. There were forced governmental policies that were in place to try to get rid of us, to try to assimilate us, to try to uh, take away our land. So the, the whole issues of, uh, um, you know, beyond just simply sh we need a roof over our heads, um, there, there was cultural survival. Um, and, and one of the communities I worked with asked me, um, you know, what if we treated cultural survival as an emergency? Not just simply as this abstract thing, but what if, you know, all tribal communities actually focused on it as, as an emergency? And so that's why I kind of take my practice and all the things that I do. Um, and you'll see I, I try to uh, work in many different ways. Um, I um, do a lot of community engagement, I do a lot of design, I, I try to mix uh, architecture, planning, landscape, um, and I'm fortunate enough to work with tribal communities all over the country, not, not every place, um, but, um, uh, but there's still time, um, and, and folks like you here are, are going to help be part of that. Uh, community engagement and authentic listening, that's, that's one of the uh, and most important things I found working with tribal communities. Uh, every chance you get to present and speak and show your work and, and actually ask a client and, and talk, take it because you're going to be in the position to uh, be responsible for listening to people and actually making something happen. Uh, Native communities have a general distrust of our profession uh, and I found that uh, quite vividly over the years. Uh, there are too many uh, professional tourists, as one person said, they want to come in. They think, "Oh, cool, let's do a, a, a Native American project and, and make it cool." And and then they build it and try to get awards, and then they're out of the community. They're not there to stay and live with it and live with the, the ramifications of what they did. So, truly understanding and listening from a uh, perspective is, is is incredibly important. So many. Uh, communities say, yeah, the last architect didn't listen to it at all. They, they just did what they wanted. So, so be mindful of that uh, as you're working. Uh, the other thing I did when I um, got back to Minneapolis, which is where my home is, is I immersed myself back into my community. I was a, a youth, a student, um, and, and within a couple of years, I was on the board of directors for the Minneapolis American Indian Center, for NACTI. Um, I'm on the board for the American Indian Council of Architects and Engineers, and I'm the uh, I'm uh, really active with the board of AIE Minnesota. So all of those things are really important to stay active in your community. Um, being part of something bigger than just your practice and, and the things around you is, is so important to understanding the world and the things that we're doing. Um, uh, like I said, I'm um, on the board of the American Indian Council of Architects and Engineers. Uh, here's a quote that uh, I often hear they say, I didn't even know there were any Native American architects. Uh, but there are plenty. If you want to know any information about them, uh, please visit their website. Um, I wanted to change the paradigm of how uh, practice was delivered, how architecture you know, delivered. sounds like such an academic thing. But it, it's on the left, you see the typical uh, organizational structure of a project. You have an owner. And they're at the top, and then there's the owner's rep, maybe, or a general contractor. You know, there's the architects. And then, and then way down in that little box are all, all the, the consultants. And somewhere in there uh, usually is community engagement as an afterthought. Um, so that's the, the paradigm I wanted to change. And the model that I want to do is put indigenous values at the center and put that community uh, at, at, at really the core of everything, to think about it from, you know, how, what, what do our traditions teach us? What, how do we design for the future? How do we engage indigenous professionals? Um, how do we create a different model that is less built on the hierarchical, linear uh, model of um, designing buildings or communities? 
Uh, so community engagement is incredibly important, whether it's all, you know, large presentations to communities, uh, small interactive design workshops. Um, but the important thing is to be meaningful and authentic and truly listen. Don't come with your ego. Come with the, the thirst and curiosity to serve and, and listen and, and really understand what the needs of that community is. Each tribal community and each community anywhere in the country is unique. And so coming in as an expert has been a real challenge in indigenous communities because there are so many experts in many different fields that come in and say, I know what you need. Uh, but um, indigenous knowledge, the collective knowledge of the community uh, is way more important than any individual person's knowledge. Uh, cultural expression, and design. I figured I, I should, uh, I, I made this title of this lecture a while ago, and then I forgot to put in cultural stuff, so I, I put it in here, but uh, cultural expression is, is incredibly important for tribes. It's part of cultural revival, cultural survival. I mean, how do you look at your traditions? This is a project for the Puyallup tribe in Washington, and they are a tribe where their reservation is actually in an urban setting, and you'll see many tribes have the land that is least uh, valuable or, or, or least desired. Um, and at the time, it was uh, their homeland is everywhere from the, the, the mountain to the sound. And so they have a river, the Puyallup River. But they live in a very industrialized area right now. Uh, and so you know, how do you take that into consideration, that living in two different worlds about tradition and then contemporary society? So I worked with uh, the community to you know, help them express and, and dis decide what they wanted to express. What do they want to be as a community? Um, thinking about all the different uh, traditions of the landscape and culture of their area, uh, their current tra traditions, how they're keeping things alive, um, and how can you do that with architecture and material expression? Uh, in this case, it was a gaming project, um, which is one of the key uh, uh, mechanisms by which tribes now are, are you know, running their economies from it's so incredibly important. Tribes are now investing that money into their communities and schools and libraries and community centers. So this is still an important uh, economic generator. But how do you how do you translate uh, culture into something that's maybe a little bit more modern? Um, I think you'll see in, in my work. I don't I don't jump on to the uh, feathers and eagles and, and and all the kind of cliches and teepees that you see uh, off oftentimes in uh, Native American design or, you know, just imagine what you would have thought in your head uh, if someone said, what do you think of, uh, about Native Americans? And you might, you know, you might come up into your mind with some of these cliches, a teepee or whatever it is. But I try to take a more modern expression, but how can you abstract different ideas? How do you let local artists actually be part of the design process? Uh, again, not taking that authorship uh, that it's me, me designing this project, but that I'm help facilitating a process because I know how to facilitate that process and to really include everyone in there. Uh, and all these projects are done with you know many many different people. I'm I'm one of large teams um, on these projects, and and there's so many different voices that have to go into making a project work. Um, and I'll just kind of go through. And my goal isn't necessarily in this conversation to talk about any one particular project because I want, wanted you to, to, to share with you uh, the overall strategy of taking culture and then getting into into built form. Um, in this case, it was a gaming facility, so it has to have that bling and flash and culture. But um, but there's so many different cultural stories in these images here that uh, that will never be shared with the general public, but the tribal members know it. And so they can go to their facilities and, and, and see their culture and see it in a way that no one else can and, and have that pride and uh, um, knowledge. So um, I got my degree in urban design. And so I have been able to um, work on projects where communities are, are, are trying to not just build buildings, but really regenerate their entire community. So how do you do that? Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later. This is for a tribal college. Uh, this is a, a part of a cultural resiliency uh, project for another tribal college. But how do you, how do you create meaning in the landscape? Uh, how, do you, how do you design in a way that uh, uh, tribal college students, tribal members, everyone can, can learn and, uh, and understand their own culture? Because a lot of that has been taken away. A lot of uh, 
tribal people don't know their culture. And so architecture and planning and all that is a wonderful way, uh, one of the ways that um, cultural revival can happen. Um, environmental justice, this is a community in California where this was all uh, an old gold mine. And so it is incredibly polluted. Uh, people can't live on there now, so I'm part of a process where there are other teams that are working to clean up this land. And their reservation is the, where they've set aside for housing is that little spot. Uh, I don't remember how many acres it is right now, but, um, but their tribal members are scattered throughout the region, and so they don't have a place to call home. So the tribal council wanted to create um, a community where culture can happen, where elders and youth can interact and live together, where there is um, community, and, uh, and that's so important for any tribe's cultural survival. Here's another project um, that I'm working with. You can see um, in the middle of the screen a, uh, a remnant of, of a slough. This area in California used to be the, the second largest lake west, uh, um, or the largest lake west of the Great Salt Lake. And farmers uh, came in and essentially irrigated it and drained it. And so now the area is, is just absolutely uh, not there. This tribe had their little square piece of land, which actually was only this part until they had to, they had to buy their land back. Uh, but they preserved that slough because it was a part of their culture. And they wanted to respect and honor the landscape rather than see it as something that's going to help them uh, uh, generate income. And so as we're working with this community, you, know, you can see the images of the slough here, um, but they really wanted their community culture to be expressed. How do you revive culture through uh, something that's, you know, you know, how many acres when we're designing 300 new housing units for their area? Um, and again, part of that community engagement process in any project is to, to listen. And these are the things that, that they said, and we distilled it down to three basic things, connect and nurture our community. Uh, restore and honor our environment and center our culture. Uh, we're still early on in the process here, but, uh, but taking cues from their already uh, uh, programs to, to restore the slough, but then create some form of urban pattern that helps honor landscape as the infrastructure that they develop things. And then to create opportunities for culture to happen so that culture isn't just like in a little museum, it's not in one building, but culture is spread out through the neighborhoods, in the parks. Uh, how you enter this community is, is going to be um, uh, from a cultural way. All these are indigenous ways of thinking about the land and the landscape. Uh, now I'm back to the uh, land acknowledgment. And, uh, uh, and thank you for doing the land acknowledgment. Um, it's incredibly important to have that awareness. Uh, I have mixed feelings about uh, land acknowledgments. Um, uh, I mean, they're, they're good, but then, you know, what is the real acknowledgement that we're doing? Because uh, a slide before a presentation is one thing, but if you're really going to truly acknowledge, you know, land, what would that mean? Um, I know that Harvard, at least from what I could find online, has 27 million square feet, 600 acres. Um, they have significant portions of land in the, the, the cities around here. Uh, Harvard has land ownership in Brazil and California, all over the place. Um, imagine the value of all that. If you add, does, I don't know if anyone even knows that, if that's a stat today. But if you imagine the market value of the land that we're standing on right here, what would that be? And, that's, uh, and then think about the endowment. Um, if you're really going to truly do a land acknowledgment, then you should invite any Native student in the world that wants to come here uh, for free to uh, come take classes and get an education. And then go back to their communities and do the work uh, that I'm trying to do. Um, that's, that's kind of a way to really think about it. Really, if you really think about the land and what you got out of the stolen land, um, that might be a little bit more impactful way of doing that. Uh, and know, know the history of the lands. Um, uh, one of the interesting things about uh, Boston is that when I was here, just before I graduated, um, it was actually illegal for me to go into Boston. There was a law that had been there. I know it was one of those archaic things, but it was still in place. That it had never been taken away. That It was illegal to, for a Native American to go into Boston until 2005. Uh, 
And um, the reason why it changed is some conference was going to be here and they were going to spend a lot of money uh, and then de they decided to pull out because of the law. Uh, and then the city decided to, to, to think about it and change it. And so finally, so I can come here right now. I, haven't, I, I didn't have to worry about getting arrested on my way to the GSD today. Um, but if you think about you know, where we are right now, we're in this building, um, and you think about all the land that, that is out there, um, it's important to understand that you know, so many different peoples were here, and I won't go through you know, the whole history of all this here, um, but this is the type of things that we learn in our school books, that there are these kind of big, large culture groups of indigenous peoples around the country, but really the complexity is way more uh, uh, nuanced, and there was trade, and there was overlapping, and and uh, indigenous cultures here were incredibly sophisticated and had uh, economies and uh, many different cultures. My tribe, Anishinaabe or Ojibwe and Chippewa, um, is this is a, about where about a, 200 years after. Uh, um, colonization started to happen where uh, Ojibwe-speaking people ended up. This is the amount right now that is uh, designated as uh, tribal land of what is left there. So this is the reservation system in the United States and in Canada. And that's my reservation, White Earth Nation. It's in northern Minnesota. Um, and then if you look at the entire country and you look at what, what's actually left in terms of uh, land um, that's, you know, on some kind of book set aside, uh, it, it's just barely anything. Then you look at the populations, um, you know, less than, most of the country has less than 2%. Uh, and, and I would say, you know, that probably less than that. Um, but you can see that uh, reservations have been a way to both uh, keep Native people sort of in a place, but it also, if you think about it from the flip side, it has been opportunities to uh, uh, keep our culture alive. Um, but the important thing to think about when you do an, a land acknowledgement, um, other than Harvard offering free tuition, um, is to realize that right now where you're sitting, a, a family lived. There might have been a burial right here. Um, people got married, people died, people lived, people hunted, right where you're standing. And, and most oftentimes, people just work, walk around Cambridge and wherever you are and don't even think about that. And so having that realization is incredibly important if you're going to think about respecting uh, land. And it's not, again, uh, a statement at a beginning of some sort of event or lecture. Uh, again, my Ojibwe-speaking tribe, probably areas there, uh, you can see the, the extent of the area. Zooming in, uh, I live in Minneapolis, and that's where I, I run my practice. Uh, White Earth Nation is where I'm enrolled. I have a lot of family on Leech Lake as well. So those are the two reservations that I've called home. And so this is the outline of, of each of those. And the, just for reference, the headwaters of the Mississippi is right here. Then it runs through this reservation, and then it goes down. This is how much is left in trust. So when I was saying, when you looked at that other map of the United States and how dwindled it had been, now take that and, and you see the checkerboarding that happens of actual land that is under um, native ownership. And there's a lot of legal differences between what's inside and outside of that black line, um, but the ownership is still not native in anywhere other than those red things. And, and how, do you, how do you build community in that context? How do you create an economy? How do you create a health or a transportation system or, or anything when you're spread out? Um, and this is uh, part of policies that were uh, aimed at dividing and conquering and illegal land uh, sales. And, and you can see the, the impact. Um, poverty rates are incredibly high. And this is uh, very similar on many different reservations across the country. Um, and in the context to my culture is, is beautiful. There's, there's the land, there's uh, uh, cultural traditions, there's the material objects, there's architecture, there's materials, there's beautiful stories of, of sustainability just embedded into this that, that we never really talk about sustainability because it's, it's just embedded into the way indigenous people think. 
Um, so there's rich traditions here to, to think about as a Ojibwe practitioner uh, to think about. Uh, I like this image. This is, uh, you can see some influence starting to happen in the architecture. So now there's essentially kind of a, almost like a balloon frame indigenous structure, but, um, and this parallels to um, some of the governmental policies that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit too. So um, as part of this cultural loss, there was the log cabins, the, the tar paper shacks, the cutting of the hair, the taking away of the traditional uh, dress, the regalia, boarding schools, um, and then as urban designers, thinking about the impact of the grid, uh, both from a transportation and from electricity and, and, and plumbing and all that. So all that you know takes a community and makes them static when their entire economies were about uh, seasonal uh, reactions to the environment and to the landscape. Um, and so, so at some point, there was the change based on all that. You can see poverty and you can see different things happening. At some point in, in our culture's um, existence, we were convinced that this type of dwelling was better than that. Uh, that's up on my reservation. It's a uh, boarded up public housing project. So these are the, the interesting things that, that frame um, the, the basis of what I do as a designer. Uh, this is my grandmother's property up in Ball Club, Minnesota. Uh, and then this is South Minneapolis, and this is where my mom lived when I was uh, born. Uh, so my grandmother, um, she, she now lives a little bit away from here, but uh, population of 165 to a population of 3.16 million. Um, so as, uh, as I grew up, I went back and forth between the different places. And so now uh, part of the reason why I came to the uh, GSD for urban design was, you know, how do you design for each of those different conditions? Uh, and, and create cultural survival in, in both. Um, this is one of my grandfathers right there. Um, this is at the ball called Powwow, and then this is Franklin Avenue in Minneapolis, and I'll talk about that in, in much more detail here in a minute. So the, the systematic policies um, that, um, and this is just a, just a, a generic baseline of what, what was happening, because there's so many different nuances and, and things that happen here, but. There was the removal and reservation area, assimilation, different acts and, and termination policies. And these were all governmental policies. And it wasn't like they were trying to hide anything. It was like, how do we get rid of the reservation so that we can have other people come in and uh, farm or extract min minerals or whatever? Um, and then, you know, how did these urban populations happen? Um, the Indian Relocation Act of 1956 um, and I won't read all of this, but it was it was about termination. It was about and there was a handbook uh, out there, and there's multiple of these. Uh, you know how, and then they gave this out to to governments, local governments, to say how can you get people off of reservations and assimilate them. Um, and so you see all these little flyers, uh, with little maps, and pointing to this is Minneapolis right there, but other cities. Uh, you can see real Indians who are going to soon come to Cleveland. Uh, Denver, so all, all over the country. And there was these um, ideas that this is gonna happen. You're gonna have a nice little community, a job. Um, you'll be pushing a stroller and, and, and living the American dream. Um, and you can see this is Minneapolis. Uh, Chicago is another, Milwaukee was another one city. But the first uh, circle is about a four hour drive. Uh, I drive a little fast, maybe it's not as big. Uh, but you can get to Minneapolis with an eight hour drive. Um, and so there's this relationship between Minneapolis and the urban centers and these reservations. And even today, people move back and forth, back and forth. Um, but in the 50s uh, and 60s, when those uh, policies were in place, uh, a Native American community formed. So this is some uh, census data. I think this is about 19, or yeah, 2010, but it's, it's still the same Native community. So the population here, uh, Formed. Uh, you can see downtown Minneapolis, this red area on the left, that is Franklin Avenue. That's where uh, it's in the middle of the Phillips neighborhood, and so that highly concentrated area of Native Americans were there. Here is an aerial. You can see sort of the economic core of it with the spaghetti of all the highways and, and sort of these barriers between some of the more affluent areas in the downtown. 
Um, and this is what Franklin Avenue was in the 1900s. It was a, it was not yet that kind of that Native American community center yet, but it was a, uh, it was a growing commercial quarter in the city of Minneapolis as it was, it was forming. Um, and then in uh, around 1950, they put in the highways, and you can see that it, it had a major impact um, on what happened in the community. Uh, and by the 60s and 70s, this is what was there. There were a lot of uh, liquor stores, there was poverty, there was uh, uh, vacant buildings. Um, and this brings up the first project. And I think this is the probably the most impactful project in my career so far. And this is one I started essentially right back when I moved back to Minneapolis after being here in Boston. Um, this is the plan of that area. The Native American Community Development Institute, um, and uh, mentioned that earlier, I'm the board president of that, but uh, even before I was part of that organization, they had done what was called the American Indian Community Blueprint, where they did community engagement about what, what they can do to help uh, change that poverty in this area. And so NACTI takes a, an asset-based based approach to development. So, you know, we're right here. You know, this is that first ring of poverty that has typically happened in American cities. Um, but, but we're actually near downtown. We're on a light rail station that was just built um, not 20 years ago, so uh, not, not too long ago. But the University of Minnesota here, there's hospitals. So how can we change the paradigm from this is a poor inner city r ring of poverty to, you know, there's some assets here. How can we develop that and how can we capitalize on this? Um, you know, Minneapolis is a, is a I think it's a great city. Here's our community. This is, uh, we had a big event. This is not everyone in our community, but we had a, a big event uh, a number of years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm, oops, I'm somewhere in the back. And I'm wearing black because I'm an architect. I think that's me right there. But uh, I'm still wearing black. But, uh, uh, but anyways, this is, this is, we're a strong, contemporary, urban native community. We have doctors, lawyers. We only have two architects in the state of Minnesota. And I think in, in the region, there's only two licensed native architects. That needs to change. Uh, Harvard should give free tuition uh, to native. I, I'll say that a couple more times throughout this lecture. But, but it's a strong, resilient community. There's a lot of great organizations that are doing great work for the community. Um, and right when I got back, you know, straight out of the GSD, you know, we're supposed to do these maps and, and do circles and diagrams, and you don't really know what they're what they're really for. But you know, uh, but once you start like really get into this and you understand like the politics and all this, they start to make a lot more sense. Um, but just did some early visioning uh, of you know what could this be? Taking some photographs and photoshopping, just the eyewash that happens. Um, but this was just uh, after they had done the community blueprint and it started to visualize like what this place could be uh, and it was incredibly helpful um, and 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 also think about the time scale that it takes to change a neighborhood uh, I am incredibly fortunate to be able to have worked on all these different projects within this zone um, again if there were more native architects you know you know please Feel free, my friend Mike. Is, he's also a native architect. He's done a couple of projects here. He's doing another here, um, but this is really the work of all those organizations. It's not me doing this, but uh, I, I, I'm part of it. Uh, there are so many different organizations doing so much to try to make this a much better place. And again, we started off by just doing these visioning. You know, what if we had community cultural events in this place instead of uh, vacant space? What if we took some of the strip mall type of development that, that's been happening and just put, bring back nature and, and probably a little bit too much eyewash on this one. But, but anyways, it, it creates kind of like a vision. Like, like there's a softer place, uh, a more indigenous, a more cultural place that we can create as a community. And again, this was you know 12 or so years ago. Um, the first project that was done, and this is the project that someone asked me to do pro bono, was taking um, an old food shelf and uh, turning it into a contemporary Native American arts uh, gallery and the offices for NACTI. And so this was the, the first project I did and, and essentially what became um, full circle. Um, so it was this old food shelf and it's really a story about transformation. So now um, taking this old building, uh, creating a place for culture and, and creating a place for contemporary culture to happen. 
Uh, there's a coffee shop now here, and it's become a, a great community gathering place for our people. And, and again, community happens here. So this is still, I think, my favorite project uh, of all time. And uh, just because simply it had a, a total impact in uh, what happened. Uh, I think that was one of my clients telling me their project should have been my favorite. But, um, uh, but farmer's markets happen outside, so it's really become a, kind of this core of this community. Um, the next project that we did uh, was a um, area in what was called the trench, and it's in between and under some underpasses, and it was a couple things. It was, uh, first of all, it was a speed trap, because there was always a cop waiting right there. Um, but uh, it was also just this vacant place between uh, this part of the community and that part of the community. The, these parcels here were just kind of this remnant of the street system that went through before until the highways and the rail came in. Um, but how do, you, how do you take and envision this and again um, do it from a standpoint of community engagement? What is, you know, I could have come in or my uh, colleagues at Cunningham Group in our landscape department could have come in and said, and designed something really beautiful, but it would ha wouldn't have had meaning without this type of effort and this type of participation. Uh, and we had different community events, and we had kids come in and draw like over pictures, and and had all sorts of different things about what could be there, and uh, uh, and then did sketches and uh, created a plan. Again, involved the community in the whole process, um, and then you know came up with a vision for what it could be before and after. And so this was an instrumental in, in actually getting this project started. It was just that visioning, just that uh, let's, let's imagine something different. Um, in Minneapolis, there's still remnants of the history of poverty. Um, American Indians are 27.1 times more likely than the general population to experience homelessness. And that's, that's I think, true in different parts of the country here. In 2018, um, something kind of tremendous happened. Uh, a huge encampment formed, and this hadn't happened in Minneapolis. Um, some of you may know about this, but um, and it, you know it was uh, predominantly Native American at first. That changed over time, but, but I, I saw it as this, this beautiful sit-in by this population that was underserved and had been forgotten. Uh, the indigenous people. Um, who were experiencing homelessness didn't feel welcome in uh, the, the, the typical homeless shelters that were there. They didn't allow families to go, homeless families to be together. They didn't allow homeless couples. Uh, they, didn't, um, uh, they didn't have cultural activities. So people chose to just um, be out in tents. And so um, after you know how many decades of this happening, um, this encampment appeared. And it happened in probably the, the spring of that year, but it really became an emergency in in the city, and, and, and it's um, extended off into the winter. So the months and months of people, and there were some deaths, there was drug use, there was things, there was all sorts of things. But the community rallied behind the people that were there. We didn't just like run, get a bunch of buses, and cart them all off, and, and say you, you know you can't do this. Uh, we tried to look for a solution that was um, something about. Cult, that was culturally based, that was about providing specific cultural services to these folks. This is where it existed in the context of the cultural corridor. Uh, Red Lake Nation, which is a tribe in northern Minnesota, owned this property right here. Um, and we were just starting uh, to design a, a, an affordable housing project right there. And so they offered to do, uh, to give their property here um, to uh, the city of Minneapolis to put up an emergency shelter. So as a community, the indigenous people uh, worked with the city of Minneapolis to take and, and prepare this site. And this, is, again, was a part of the city that got cut off by the highways. And so there was some manufacturing here, but a lot of that was vacant. Um, and we did some emergency shelters. Uh, and in this winter in Minneapolis, it got, got down to like negative uh, 29 degrees one day. And we got them in just before. And there's, you know, there's nothing like great about putting people in the tents. Um, but this is urban design, it's architecture. It's, we saved, uh, the community saved lives there. Um, right as it started to, 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 to snow. On that same site, 
the following year, we started designing uh, affordable housing unit. So housing is an incredibly important part of this. And so this housing unit wasn't just a housing project. They, the Red Lake put their uh, governmental offices in it. There are amenity spaces. There's community spaces. There's a daycare, community kitchen. There is a, a clinic. Uh, and so it was providing the services for the residents who lived there right where uh, they could just walk downstairs and get it because transportation is an issue. Uh, and as the, the design team worked on it, and this was with the Cunningham Group, we, we wanted to bring uh, Red Lake, the reservation, the, the colors, the beautiful things about Red Lake, down to this kind of dilapidated part of the city of Minneapolis and really try to take into you know, the cues from nature, um, thinking about ideas of domesticity, culture, how do you, how do you be creative with it in, in more of a, a fun but a, a modern way? How do you address uh, the, the community wanted their clans uh, animals to be um, expressed in the architecture um, and, uh, and we, we, we went from this uh, to that so people now are hosed and so this uh, again is just outside of Minneapolis you can see how the highway cuts and the train tracks and this used to be those dilapidated old buildings and now there's uh, housing uh, with health care community cultural space gardens uh, all in the c context of the American Indian Cultural Quarter. You can see this, uh, again, this is Franklin Avenue right there. And this is that piece of land that we've, that we've reclaimed. And, and this, this area here was for sale for, for many, many years. This project here across the street from it is the next project that I'm going to talk about real quick, um, Homeward Bound. So there was this old cardboard manufacturing, or they, they put together cardboard boxes. Uh, and again, that need for homeless shelters didn't go away once we did the affordable housing, because that type of housing model doesn't work for everyone. So you have to provide housing choices for everyone. And so we were able to take this old um, manu or cardboard factory and create a place for housing to happen. Again, a, another transformation of the space. Um, artists came in and did murals on the walls. Um, another project um, is Migazi Communication. This is a, a youth uh, program, and I was actually in this in third grade in, in Minneapolis. And it was a great program that takes youth uh, and gives them uh, job training, uh, things to do after school. It provides them with uh, community. Uh, and this is another pro bono project that I had done. I, they had gotten this um, storefront um, in South Minneapolis, and, and so we did a uh, design that gave them a shop, gave them a media space where they could do, um, you know, practice doing interviews and and flexible space here, meeting rooms, you know, not not, not you know that complicated of a project, um, um, but it was a place for community to happen. And so this is our opening night. We had a big uh, celebration. Uh, this is uh, you know, again the. Uh, first night, they came in and they put a whole bunch of artwork and filled it with furniture. Um, and you can see that you know it was part of this old structure that had all these old these old beams. We put in uh, the new um, ductwork and and opened it up. Um, and then George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. And so I, I know we all know the the, um, kind of the history of that, but Minneapolis became the epicenter of uh, an uprising. Um, and this is the same view. Uh, the day after that uprising. And so this organization, this youth organization, um, uh, everything we, that we just built and just opened up a few months earlier was gone. And this wasn't targeted by the uprising. It was near the police station where the police that were dispatched um, from uh, was a block away from this. And, and embers uh, went on the roof and, and burned it. Um, and so the, it, w it wasn't targeted, so I just want to make that clear. But the impact is that the organization lost everything, and so this is this is the next morning. We we, we couldn't get in. We you know the building was still up, um, and this is, this is I took this photograph. You can see the building right there. You could see a little bit of smoke came in, out of there, so we had a little bit of hope left. But then when we got into it, we finally realized it was it was lost. So through this pandemic, this is where their building was over here. Uh, we found a new structure for them and got an old, another old existing building. 
and uh, during the pandemic did, again, community engagement. We had it live streamed on Facebook for people who didn't want to be there in person, but socially distanced, and, and we got a lot of great ideas from the youth. And the youth were really instrumental in uh, helping design this facility. There is uh, the existing building, um, and this is a new addition that's going to hold their workshop and community gathering space. But they really insisted on it being a sustainable project. At first, we were just trying to do, all right, let's just get into the building and, and do as, as little as we can to just get you operational again. Um, but they insisted, no, we're, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it, do it right. And so we went through this process of taking uh, their ideas, looking at culture, how they operated, uh, a little rendering of that. And this is us about three or four weeks ago doing the groundbreaking. So another story of uh, resiliency and kind of the community coming back um, to, to rebuild. Um, you know, how do you think about health care in the context of, of an urban native community? Health, uh, recreation, um, education, all these things are important parts of indigenous communities and Native American community clinic works in a, in a very cultural way. So we had this site of this old Dollar Tree in this, um, this old uh, strip mall. And one of the renderings that I had done uh, you know, 12 years ago is now being done here. So it takes that, that long to get something like this actually going. So we're taking, again, changing this and providing a, a new way of thinking about uh, healthcare. And to do it from a kind of a, a modern indigenous perspective, modern, um, you know, not, not, not a huge budget, but this is uh, an opportunity to create something that uh, provides dignity for people who are going um, to get health care, to provide, provide a, a place where you can get health care in the context of culture, which is so important to uh, healing. We're actually taking a little bit of shift in what we're doing now, and we're going to do a similar project where there is housing over the clinic. So before we were essentially renovating the strip mall, and now we're gonna go ahead and, and just rethink the whole property and do uh, a much more powerful project that, that honors their goals and their missions from an urban standpoint. This is the American, Minneapolis American Indian Center. And just interestingly enough, this was the site of my undergraduate thesis. So I, I have the honor to do my thesis project. Uh, it was a building built in 1975, and you can see the kind of the, the big, heavy, uh, almost Corbusian nature of it, but uh, a lot of angles, a lot of kind of wasted space. But over the years, it's become um, run down, I'll put it that way. It, it doesn't have that presence on the street. There's a, you know, a lot of um, activity that shouldn't be happening. There's a lot of repairs. Um, and so we're creating uh, a way to bring it more um, pedestrian friendly, bring it to the street, to have uh, community space inside of it. Again, this was the old building right there, and so now we're uh, infilling essentially what was unused space. Uh, staff in the community were really uh, adamant that all the landscaping have cultural stories to it which is great, so designing from not just the building, but cult, you know, culture comes in landscape and interior design, uh, landscape. Uh, had many different community meetings, what are the most important cultural plans to have in this? Um, and then just creating space for culture to happen, to do it in a little bit more modern way. So these are kind of preliminary renders because we've been in the fundraising process for about five or six years now, and so we're still um, aiming to get under construction here within the year. But um, one of the important things about this project is during the pandemic, there we have a clinic. This is, I mean, not a clinic, a cafe. This is how we're envisioning the new uh, cafe. Um, but we were able, we, even though we had to shut down the cafe, um, we were able to uh, keep it open to still feed the elders throughout the whole pandemic. So we didn't have the community coming in anymore, but we were able to send food out to the indigenous elders who used to come to the center for food. Now we were able to bring them um, food themselves. Uh, another important kind of mix of planning and design is this project, Walk on Teepee Center. Right here, there is um, a very important Dakota cultural site. Uh, it's part of a 
essentially creation story. This was uh, up along here. There are burial mounds. It's essentially a, a cemetery. You can see the railroads right here. Um, in uh, the last century, the there was a railroad company that came in, um, needed more land, so they dynamited and, and got rid of the cave. So everyone was very well aware that there was an important cultural site there, um, but they needed uh, a couple more tracks so they could get more industry and commerce and progress. But, but, they, but they essentially blew up that and probably some burial mounds. Um, the Bruce Ventro Nature Sanctuary and the people working on that over the past like 10 years have now reclaimed that, cleaned the whole site up, and now it's a nature sanctuary. And so here's another story of, you know, lost something, but we're going to take it back. Um, and, and then the question was, okay, now we want a building on, on the site. So we did a, a lot of community engagement. The community wanted to honor the landscape. They wanted to honor Dakota culture, Dakota ceremony, because those are the types of things that would happen on the site. Uh, again, it's in the context of St. Paul, Minnesota. Here is their downtown, the Mississippi River. And all this area up here um, are burial mounds and cultural sites. The thing to think about, um, let me go back here, is here is downtown St. Paul. Uh, all the skyscrapers are up there, many different projects. Um, traditionally, there were probably burial mounds all along this whole ridge, and they've been completely erased for the, for the skyscrapers. So we don't even know what's been lost there, but we're, what we're trying to do is map out and preserve what is remaining. So cultural preservation, um, just having actual control of a site. So here is, again, we're in the later stages of fundraising on this project, um, cultural space, gathering space, space for the uh, community to um, essentially gather and then go off into the landscape. We're trying to keep the nature sanctuary as clear as possible. Uh, and so hopefully we're going to be starting construction on this at some point soon. Um, near that site in St. Paul, I talked about different ways of a community grows and against health, uh, economics, uh, education is an important part of that. This is the American Indian Magnet School in St. Paul. Uh, it's an old, like 1920s brick school, a high school building, and so now they've um, made it into a school that has uh, sort of the theme of American Indian education and culture and values. You can see the old brick building right there, and so now we're inserting stuff in the middle and, and renovating some of the existing stuff here, but trying to do it in a cultural way to allow the students to learn in, in ways that honor and allow the teachers to teach from a cultural perspective. Um, and again, uh, transforming a space like that into this. So again, all these projects are part of that, that, that sort of that one urban design exercise that we had done you know, 12 years ago that NACTI had started you know, long before I got there. Um, and we've transformed from this, uh, this uh, street of poverty and, and, and lack of hope and, and, and uh, bars to something that um, you know we put put up banners, we have festivals, we close the street uh, often, and and uh, and so it goes back to like what happens to a community when you do these types of things to to them, and then you know what what happens after that, and what's the solution? And for me and for tribal communities, it's sovereignty. So let's change all that trajectory and change it to something else. So. Uh, sovereignty and self-determination. So all these changes weren't happening until the indigenous community actually, we did it ourselves. And that's true in, in urban areas as well as in uh, rural reservation areas. Um, and then as you go out in your careers and you are going to do projects on indigenous land, because every project you're going to do is on indigenous land, and there are going to be indigenous people who live there, still live there, and there are going to be tribal communities that are adjacent or impacted by what you do. So um, just be mindful of that as, as, you, as you work. Um, you know, truly listen, incorporate ideas. Um, with that, thank you. I, I, I went through a lot.
Uh, but I think it was uh, hopefully a good overview of um, what I've chosen to do is take my architecture degree, add the urban design and planning, commit back to my community, uh, focus on projects and developments that, that are about community resiliency, uh, uh, community re rebuilding projects that allow for culture and, and healing and education to happen in, in, in an indigenous way. And then to do it in the context of, uh, you know, hopefully, a, a thinking seven generations from now, uh, thinking about it from a contemporary standpoint, not from a nostalgic uh, point, but to look at tradition, to what our ancestors have taught us already, and how can we take that forward, uh, and really take the responsibility um, that um, with the knowledge that I've, I've been fortunate to have gotten here and, and throughout my career, to bring that back and do something that is actually meaningful to communities. So um, with that, I, wanted, I just want to change this to a, a, a dialogue. Um, I can't believe I only took one glass of water drink from my water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank, thanks, Sam. That was not only inspiring, it was, I think, uh, refreshing. Um, the, the, the closing comment, truly listen, you talked about not bringing your ego into a project. At a certain point, you refer to your favorite project because of the impact it had. Those aren't things we hear every day in Gun Hall, unfortunately. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, I want to, you know, mostly turn it over to the audience, and, and I know we've got some, some questions here um, on the live stream, but maybe I'll just kick things off with a question. I thought it was interesting. You started by, by saying, well, this, this, this format is in some ways unfamiliar. You're at a podium, you're speaking to an audience, and in some of the communities and some of the cultures you work in, that's unfamiliar. You know, and, and I'm wondering if what other examples you've encountered of that. For example, you do a lot of community engagement. We all have ways of doing, conventional ways of doing community engagement. We put maps on the wall. We ask people to put sticky notes up. We have charrettes. <laughs> and I guess I would love to hear some more examples maybe of either from engagement or through space making, right, through the architecture you do of how you've come, you've encountered, um, or you, you, you've evolved you, the, uh, the, the traditional way of doing things, or the things that, you've, things that maybe you learned at the GSD, and how they've maybe uh, evolved, and how you've adapted those for some of the projects you've worked on. Okay. Um, again, the, the, the th probably the most important lesson that I've learned through you know, many community engagement pieces that they're all smarter than us. So, um, you know, I'm humbled when I go into community and uh, they know their community, they know their needs. Um, uh, I can learn how to draw, I can learn how to think, I can learn how to, you know, do all the things that we do as designers and architects, but, um, but really the community should lead the engagement process. And so I can, you know, help facilitate and I can help uh, bring ideas to that. But really, when I work with the community, I always engage with their cultural leaders, uh, their political leaders, um, and develop uh, relationships before we even do the community engagement so that, that they decide what happens in the community engagement. Because uh, I could make a checkbox of all the things that I think are right for a community engagement process, and it'll be wrong every time I bring it to a different community because it, it has to come from within. It has to come from that community. And then that, that ownership and that authorship is then by that community. So then they have that sense of, you know, we did this. Um, and I think that's, that's that different mindset than um, the podium of I'm an expert and I'm going to tell you uh, and you should learn from me. Uh, so think about it from the opposite perspective that, you know, we probably have way more to learn from the community than we have to, to give back to them. So in, in some ways we have to do community engagement in order to know what kind of community engagement to do. Yeah, yeah no, exactly, yes. yeah. I yeah. even like calling it community <laughs> engagement. It's, it's like there's these buzzwords uh, that, uh, that are so limiting and defining that uh, it, it gets in the way. So uh, if you can 
get rid of our design cliches when you're working with native communities that that's also an important thing to do yeah um, thanks for that so um let's uh let's open the floor for questions i think there's a, a microphone that's being passed around h hi sam thank you so much um again for being here and for sharing your work I was wondering if you could speak to some of, it, most of the projects you showed us were um, in an urban context. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about what what maybe the biggest challenges or, or differences are between um, working on projects for kind of urban indigenous populations versus projects that are either on reservation land or in rural contexts. The first answer to that is, Maybe that there's none. It's still based on a specific cultural's, a culture's tradition, and so um, if there's a, a tribe like mine that has lands, homelands that are in more rural settings, uh, in various rural settings, forested, you know, different types of areas, and then in urban, it's still the same cultural values. Uh, so that's the that's the kind of the baseline. The, and then there are the community goals of bonding, about community strengthening, about education, about economies, about preserving the environment. Those things can be applied. Um, then the second answer to that is, is, is it, it is different when you have um, urban conditions because there's, there's all the infrastructure of, of urban conditions. Uh, for example, on Migazi's project, we're trying to do um, a vertical geothermal well, but uh, if you've ever had to deal with the city in terms of locating a well in in an, in, a, in a city, there's just so many different hoops. There's there's different regulations, zoning, et cetera, in an urban setting where you don't control the land. On reservations, uh, which is trust land, which is a legal status, uh, tribes are sovereign nations, so they can say we're going to have codes or we're not going to have codes. They they usually adopt their local codes. Um, but they have the power and authority to, to govern their own community. So it can be easier uh, on reservation land to make certain decisions than you could within a small property within uh, another different uh, context. Uh, the project I showed in Tacoma is a reservation in an urban setting. So it's kind of a combination of both an urban setting and uh, reservation land. And so they had streets that had uh, rights of ways through their tribal land on the reservation in the city. And so when we were doing the project that I showed, I didn't show a whole lot of it, but, um, but their, their, their building wouldn't fit on any of the sites. So it, they had just done all this infrastructure with all the plumbing and sewer and all that, so we couldn't vacate streets. So what we had to do is take and build the project up in the air. We took two parking garages and and spanned all the streets. So it was kind of an innovative way of dealing with a very restrictive urban uh, setting that is both reservation and not. So, um, and then there are small projects where uh, there's no electricity or there's no uh, sewer and stuff. So you know you get to learn about uh, septic and, and how to deal things. And, and you can do that. And it's a great sustainable story. It's like, why, why create all that infrastructure when you can um, Utilize the earth and the sun and, and all that to get your power and and uh, and, and, uh, and all that. So there's there's many different things from just that physical standpoint and uh, and a legal standpoint. But uh, but the common thread is that a culture still has its same goals wherever it is. It wants to thrive. It wants to um, celebrate its own culture. It wants to practice its culture. It wants to it's, it wants to be. So that part of it is the same. Other questions? Yes, right in the middle. Hello, thank you so much for, for your talk. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to ask one. Um, and that one is about like what it means to, to do architecture um, from a native perspective or from an indigenous perspective in non-native communities. Um, or what your thoughts are about that. Like, how do, what does it look like? I would guess there are different challenges <laughs> um, and that the process looks different. 
Um, there's, the, well, there's, I think there's a spectrum of experiences and activities. Any, anywhere from tomorrow, I'm going to be missing a meeting on a project with a community organization that uh, is adjacent to a project, and and they've already said we want to write you a, le a letter of recommendation. We you know we're all for this, and so we get the strong support. Um, and then there's communities, and a couple that I showed up there were. Um, there are border towns, and there are indigenous communities with reservations, and then there is a non-indigenous community, and the relationship isn't isn't always positive. Um, where uh, there's been access to resources, uh, challenges. Um, uh, I'm trying to be diplomatic here, but sometimes they just don't like each other, and and they don't want. Um, uh, sometimes there's animosity to the fact that a tribe has its own sovereign sovereignty and can do what it wants. Um, why do they get to do this and why do, and then there are the times when it's like, well, you, you, you put us on a piece of crap land and we can't do anything with it because it's radioactive. And so, yes, you're gonna you know do what you can do to survive as a culture. So, um, uh, there, you know, again, I'm, I'm having to be diplomatic here a little bit because uh, uh, there there are still challenges. But then f I, I would say that for the most part, by far, there is so much uh, support for indigenous communities to do projects, to do it from an indigenous way, to 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 do beautiful work that is meaningful and and helps impact the community. This the American Indian Culture Corridor that that's going to help the entire city of Minneapolis and the region. Um, it's not just about that. It's going to have so many reverberating effects uh, that are positive that uh, we're getting so much uh, uh, outpourings of help. Megazine, when it burned down, uh, we got so many um, um, donations and, and support that uh, it's just, it's truly humbling to, to be part of that process. Hi, Sam. Thank you again so much for your presentation. Um, the question I have for you is, I think with a lot of the pressures that planners are facing, I, I think, so I, I'm from New Mexico, so I grew up with indigenous, I, I grew up with um, like indigenous design examples throughout the state. But I'm seeing more and more, like it, especially in the GSD, like in more in the East Coast and like not where I'm from, um, folks turning in education or in planning to indigenous practices as like sources of knowledge and, and sources of like what would an alternative to what we have currently be. And um, I guess one of the questions that I have, I was really struck by the, the term you used of professional tourism. And I'm really interested in like how folks that aren't coming from indigenous communities can turn to some of this like in knowledge base and engage with that in a way that is useful to and and um, non yeah just like beneficial. Yeah, so it's, it's another uh, complex question. Thank you. Um, I think there are many just beautiful lessons that we can get from you know indigenous communities from around the world about respecting a landscape. To, to know that your culture emerged from that landscape uh, and the trees and, and the plants and the animals, they all sustained you. Uh, and if you harmed that, then you were harming yourself. Um, and that, that knowledge that, that we're all related, not only to each other, but we're related to the earth and to the rocks and to the water and, and, and all that, it, 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 it's, it's just so true. Um, and there, there's so much to learn. Um, there's in addition to professional tourists, there's also culture shoppers that has been a, a challenging thing in our communities because there are oftentimes people who romanticize indigenous peoples and cultures and, and they take from it. And so it's a, it's a one way, uh, I'm gonna take this. There are, um, you know, there's been new agers, there's been, there's different sort of subcultures that, uh, have a fascination with indigenous people and romanticize it to the point where it waters it down and it it, it just dilutes it to this uh, kitsch that is harmful. And so sometimes over-respecting or over-glamorizing something 
um, is a is really can be a harmful thing that happens, especially if you're just taking from it. If you, if you're going to say, um, you know, it's like uh, again I'm being diplomatic here, but uh, uh, but I'll pick on Pendleton blankets. Um, uh, so they've been using indigenous patterns and designs for a hundred years uh, and have barely given back. Uh, and they're probably going to call me tomorrow. But uh, I said that out loud. But th that, that's, that, that's one example of that. Um, there is a, an alternate business that's owned by the Snoqualmie tribe uh, that is now uh, in the same state uh, providing indigenous, indigenous um, artists to, to sell their stuff. Um, and so, if there there's there's alternatives to the, those kinds of things, um, but you need to think about like you know borrowing from design or borrowing you know um, there, there's just Urban Outfitters had in Target you know anyone bought anything called Cherokee or you know there's there's so many different things where that culture taking is one way, but for all those people who are taking inspiration from culture. They're not. They're not living the hardships of the people that created it. They're not donating it back. They're not volunteering. They're not uh, necessarily. And I'm, that's not. I'm, I'm trying not to say blanket statements. But but if you're going to take from a, a culture, uh, make sure you're giving back, equally if not more. Um, but learning from it and honoring it, giving credit where it's due, I think is all important. And then working with the actual indigenous peoples to understand it because you're you're not going to learn about an indigenous community through Google or in a book the only way you can really truly know it is to have lived it and so if you're not indigenous you, there's just certain things you're not going to understand um, and and respect that you got to respect a culture's space to let them exist and uh, and not appropriate it's called cultural appropriation um, and uh, and I could I could go on for a couple hours on that, but just uh, I, again, it's about respectfully listening, getting it from a source, giving back, and honoring and giving credit. It's, it's some of the issues surrounding that, but it's a it's a very good question. Curious uh, how that plays out, and then Graham will get to your question now. Here's how that plays out on Franklin Ave, and I'm I'm wondering if if there's any worry that it could be a victim of its own success and I mean that in two ways on the one hand I suspect um, it's there's a tourist element there right at there and presumably that's good for businesses you could imagine um, it evolving <laughs> into something somewhat disnified right we hope that won't happen but you could imagine that happening you could also imagine it just becoming a really great neighborhood that people want to live in and being worried that Property values go up. There's a certain amount of gentrification. Maybe there's pre retail pressure. In fact, this is a question that a number of people uh, on the on the live live stream want me to ask. You know, is the coalition thinking about how to set guardrails to avoid gentrification after improvements in the corridor? So, would love to hear you talk about how all this relates to to Franklin. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, again, I'll, I'll give credit to to NACDI for taking this asset based approach to development, to look at the vacant parcels that were uh, there, and when a vacant parcel comes up for sale, to to go in and, and try to find a way for the indigenous community to own it. Because once you own it, if you if you own the earth, then you can do what you need to on it. it it's hard when you're um, an indigenous organization renting in a space, or if you don't own it, um, they're, they're not going to necessarily do um, what the overall community necessarily wants to do, um, all sorts of caveats uh, um, to everything. But um, but again, if you take an approach of we're going to do it on our terms, and that's what NACTI did with this American Indian uh, Community Blueprint, is that they did a ton of internal community engagement. They, they listened and they had discussions within themselves. Um, that's why I don't like use that term community engagement because it's like when you're, when you're talking as a community, it, it's not like it's someone else coming in and facilitating you. You're just, you're, you're thinking about what you as a community need. And Minneapolis is interesting because it has Dakota, Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, and, and other tribes. And so there isn't like one voice of, you know, this is the Dakota 
view. This is the Ojibwe view. It's um, you have to you have to talk and have those dialogues. And when you create a vision for your community uh, from yourselves, and that's what one of my last slides talked about was that sovereignty piece. You had all the things that are whittling away off, um, against community cohesion. What what gives that back? And it's self determination. And it's doing things on your own term. And so. There, there was a, a request from the community, let's have more businesses, but let's put them in the, the hands of the people. Let's give opportunities for native people to own businesses in their own neighborhood, which hadn't happened before. And they were, you know, mo that neighborhood was all owned by non-natives and, and that has been changing over and over. So as more native uh, ownership happens, more control happens, more controlling of destiny, uh, and, um, and that's where that true success will come is when it's a community doing it for themselves. Thank you. Uh, Grant. Sure. Thank you for the fantastic talk. Our Anishinaabe cultures are based on oral traditions, and so storytelling plays a really pivotal role in, in how we share and communicate our knowledge with each other. And it, it originates from the environments in which we engage. So how do you think about storytelling in terms of your design? And how do you think about the new stories that are being developed by community, uh, particularly in the era of climate change, when our environments will be changing around us? Yeah, I think, I think it's, that's, it's a really incredibly important thing to say, because your, your world view stems from your relationship to your environment, but also how uh, your language allows you to think. Um, there is no word for architect or art in Ojibwe language. Um, so what hap What do I call it when I do it? You know, I have to use <laughs> I have to use that term. Um, but the thing to think about by knowing that there is no word is that it wasn't something that was compartmentalized out of something. It was part of everyday life and survival was to 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 live and, and and be related to everything around you. And so when you understand truly that everything is related, you understand that your impact in one move is going to impact everything around you and come and come back. Um, and so, in, in the context of storytelling uh, and oral cultures, um, uh, and, and again, it wasn't a written culture either. So I mean, we're using. The, the alphabet f to 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 write uh, indigenous languages. Uh, some indigenous languages had uh, writing, but uh, um, but all these things just are a reminder to look back at tradition and ancestors and understand the knowledge that they they've provided to us um, from the standpoint of how they might have thought about it. Um, um, one of the ways we've approached design, um, and I've, I was a principal at Cunningham Group Architects for many years, and one of our sayings was, every building tells a story, and that really applied to, to tribal buildings because tribes wanted to express their culture, um, and they wanted to express uh, a deeper meaning in the projects that they that we did, and, and as well as in the urban design and landscape piece of it as well. So the, the stories are told from um, different perspectives, how you shape a building, how you um, integrate it into the landscape, how you design a community, um, what what are some literal things that you do, what are some subtle things that you do. Um, and it's, it's a very uh, complex thing because, again, every culture is different. They have their own stories. They tell it from different perspectives. Um, and you have to go into each community and understand what is the story that they want to tell and how do they want to tell it? Uh, what do they want to keep to themselves? There's many sacred things that they say, we can't, we can't do this. Um, we can't express that in, in, um, in our design because that's something that is reserved for just the community. Um, and again, it's very nuanced and it's a great question and you're going to have a wonderful time trying to uh, figure that out. It's eight. Do we have time for one more? OK. Um, Maybe two more. We'll see. Uh, there's a question on the on the live stream. What that that's an interesting one. What are your feelings about non-native architects designing dwellings for indigenous populations? And that is a question. I, I'm curious to hear an your answer about that. As you know, I taught a studio where I was working with a dozen mostly non-native students, and often the students were 
wrestling with this question. I don't live in this neighborhood. I'm not native. Why, you know, why am I uh, des designing things or making any proposals at all? Um, so I'd love to hear your, you know, your candid thoughts about, again, this question of non-native architects designing dwellings, or maybe more broadly, doing planning, doing urban design. Yeah. Well, another way to think about it is when I was working here in Boston, I designed uh, with Elkis Manfredi uh, a uh, multifamily housing project in Medford, and I bet you none of them know that their housing was designed by a Native American. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that kind of blow their minds? So it goes both ways. Right. So, uh, but, uh, but, you know, there's, there's not at this time enough Native architects to do every Native project. Uh, I, get, uh, I get a little overwhelmed with the opportunities that come my way, and I'm very honored and humbled by it. Um, and, and so we need people to help. We need you know, partners to help build. You know, hopefully, at some point, every community is going to have their own architects, their own lawyers, their own educators, you know, et cetera, everything. Um, but for now, that's not the case. Um, I would say to anyone working with a tribe is to, again, maybe some of the lessons I've already said here is to just, just honor and respect and s step back and give space. Um, you know, it's always interesting when I go, when I, um, compete for a project through an RFP process. It's an indigenous project. It's a Native American something. Um, and I'm going at it, and there are other non-Native firms also going at, at it against us. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, me and my friend Mike Labrador, uh, he, uh, we go after similar projects. Uh, and um, and then sometimes we don't get them. <laughs> you know, the, the, two native architects in Minnesota, and then someone else gets it. So that's always like a, like a head scratcher. Um, but uh, again, if, if we need people all to, to work together to the same goals, and it's the tribal goals. And uh, for if you're uh, an architect or if you find yourself in, in a position, um, maybe step aside and let an architect that is indigenous or from that community be part of it, or partner up. Um, or provide opportunities for uh, native interns or, or or people to be part of that. But uh, but I think tribal communities are very welcoming to people who have knowledge to help them grow and 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 and, and uh, develop stuff. And again, if if you are doing a process that allows that community to really truly be the designers, um, then that gives them that ownership and authorship of what they're doing. Uh, but never. Never go and work with the native community to try to win an award, or to to blow a budget, or to to over design or do something for any kind of egotistical or self-serving purpose. Because um, you know that's if anything, it's unethical and it's not really doing anything to help that community. So um, um, there's ways to serve, it and you can do that as an as an ally. So it all comes back to checking your ego, <laughs> and uh, really focusing on the process um, and stepping aside when needed. I think that's really good advice. I hope uh, everyone is taking notes. <laughs> and um, thank you so much. This is just a really inspiring and, like I said, refreshing uh, talk. It's great to see your work. Thank yeah. you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks.